cannot do this at all. Right? Debugging a quantum program is basically not possible in, the, in this classical way because you can't just stop the program after in the middle and examine the state. The state is this quantum superposition, you know, that you can you could try to measure it, but then it basically all collapse. So formal methods are probably even more important or more uh, important in a more obvious way in quantum computing than in classical computing. All right, and, and I personally also like languages that are well-defined, maybe should have a mathematical semantics, you know, precisely so that we can prove something about that. And the final thing a quantum programming language should do is enforce the physics. So by this, I mean, the physicists always get upset by this because they say, you, you computer scientists don't need to enforce physics. Nature enforces physics, right? It's not gonna let you do anything that's not, you know, that's not allowed according to the laws of physics. But what, what I mean is every programming language any sort of computer program could potentially produce errors at two different times. It can have compile time errors and runtime errors. And a safety guarantee means that, you know, if you don't have any compile time errors, then you're not going to have any runtime errors. So except maybe for out of memory or something like that. So we, we would like, and in quantum computing, there's sort of additional sources of errors that come when you try to do a non-physical operation. And we would ideally like the type system to catch these all at compile time. All right, so Quipper is our most practical quantum programming language. So this is a language that is embedded in Haskell, um, and, and therefore Haskell is a subset of Quipper in a sense, well in the sense that every Haskell program is also a valid Quipper program. And, and it's very practical, so we have taken seven fairly complicated quantum algorithms from the literature and implemented these in Quipper, and you know they produce circuits of 30 million gates and more, Right, or 30 billion, I can't remember exactly. Like, anyway, I wanna say a gazillion gates, right? And it's, it's very scalable and very practical, um, but it's not type safe. So Quipper, the language which is embedded in Haskell, is not type safe. There are many Quipper programs that you can write that are gonna crash or give you runtime errors. And the reason this happens is because there's a mismatch between the embedded language and the host language. So the host language is Haskell, so Haskell does not have linear types in the sense of linear logic, and Haskell also is not dependent. It doesn't have dependent types. These two features um, would be needed if we wanted to make a type-safe version of Quipper, okay? So the linearity comes from the physics. If you have a qubit, you know, you can say, please apply this control not operation to qubit numbers i and j, right? As Jennifer explained in her talk, but what do you do if i is equal to j, okay? You cannot apply a binary operation to qubit five and qubit five. That's not physically possible. So you, you know, basically um, uh, that would be a duplication error. So th the slogan is that quantum resources cannot be duplicated. So that's why you need sort of linearity. And dependent types is the subject of my talk. So I'll sort of uh, motivate why dependent types would be useful in Quipper. So Quipper we designed um, roughly 2012-ish, so maybe eight years ago. And you know, it's, it's practical, you can download it and it works, right? Now, but as researchers, we want to basically investigate type safe fragments of Quipper, right? So get rid of the embedded language approach and just make a, make a system with typing rules, you know, that you can prove stuff about. So we have a whole family of such languages called Proto Quipper, which basically just means the prototype for the next, you know, for the type safe Quipper. And you know, just like Microsoft has you know, Windows ME, Windows XE, Windows ML, you know, Windows 7, Windows 10, we have ProtoQuipper S, ProtoQuipper M, ProtoQuipper D, right? Every few years we produce a new one of these. Uh, so that's just sort of what you do when you try to, you know, at first you have a really small language, it's type safe but completely useless, and then you try to close the gap between that and the actual Quipper by adding more and more features to it. So one thing that all the Quipper-like languages do is they're all languages for describing quantum circuits, okay? Not just languages for, for programming a QRAM device, that, that was what Jennifer was talking about. So, a quant so when you, you know, instructions for a QRAM device are something like, please initialize qubit number seven to the state zero, please apply this gate, please measure this gate, right? But what a circuit is, it's basically just a list of operations. Like uh, it's basically a batch file saying these are gonna be all the unitary operations that I'm gonna ask my QRAM device to perform, but maybe I'm gonna just store these in a file uh, 
and then send the entire file to the QRAM device rather than doing it one instruction at a time. So a this is an example of a quantum circuit. The wires here are the actual qubits. Each uh, box here is a gate, right? Some gates involve two qubits, okay? So we found from, from a, a practical experience with Kripper, you know, actually implementing quantum algorithms on the literature, we found that 99% of the quantum programmer's work is to construct the circuit, and then only 1% is to actually run the circuit, right? The hard part is constructing very, very complicated oracles that do, you know, and large circuits that are supposed to do certain things. And the way they are described in the literature is typically at a fairly high level, right? So here's a, it's not a quote, I just made this one up, but this is what be sort of the typical level of abstraction, how the, how the, uh, an algorithm would be described in the literature. It is well known that such and such problem can be solved in polynomial time. Therefore, there exists a polynomial size classical circuit, you know, like a Boolean circuit for this problem. We will use standard techniques to make the circuit reversible, then translate to a quantum circuit, and then we will apply phase estimation using trotterization with a step size of 0 0.1 and, you know, 10,000 iterations, you know. And then, you know, the, uh, you know, the competent quantum programmer is supposed to translate that into a circuit that probably has already, you know, several millions or possibly billions of gates. So in a programming language, we want to work at that level of abstraction, which means we would ideally like to be able to write an actual classical <laughs> Pascal program, for example, which actually does solve such and such problem in polynomial time. Then we would ideally have some kind of compiler transformation that automatically uh, gets the circuits from that program, right? Then we would automatically, we'd like to maybe have some, so there's this, so the point is that circuits have to be first class citizens in Quipper, because often what you do is you construct a circuit and then you do a, an operation on the circuit, for example, make it reversible or replace all the such and such gates by these other gates, right, or simplify the circuit or uh, even revert the circuit and so on. So, so that's why Quipper is a circuit description language. It's also a functional programming language, so now, and it's linear, okay, for the reasons I described. So now imagine that you have your most generic sort of functional programming language. It has the usual types, the usual function types and applications and so on, maybe, uh, so, you know, data types, and, um, and you have sort of all the usual stuff, except it's a linear language. You have a type of qubits, okay? You have a type of, maybe you have a type of booleans also, and other data types like lists of qubits and so on. And then the, the extra things that make it sort of quipper-like are these box and unbox and circ operations. So if, let's say A and B are um, uh, qubit types, so for example, A could be qubit and B could be qubit tensor qubit, which would be the type of two qubits, right? Then, you know, in, on the one hand, we can think of a quantum operation as a function from A to B. So a function that inputs a qubit and outputs two qubits. And that's sort of how we think when we think at the QRAM level, right? You have a qubit called X, and then you, you know, say, let Y be a new qubit, and then apply the control not gate, and then output X and Y, something like that. But we can also think of a circuit as a first class citizen. That's like a circuit that has already been constructed in memory, now ready to be operated on by other operations. Now I could take this boxed circuit that's a data structure, and I could revert it, for example or I could expand it, or apply error correction to it, or apply control to it, or what, whatever you want, right? So these two types, A, R, O, B, and circ A, B, are isomorphic in the semantics, because they both describe the set of quantum operations from A to B, but they're treated differently in the operational semantics, because that thing is a function, which is basically a thunk, a lambda abstraction is a value of this type, and you can't really do anything to, with it unless you apply it to a value, whereas the box circuit is actually a data structure that you can inspect, right? So if we take a circuit generating function and we turn it into the actual circuit, we call that the boxing, and there's also the inverse operation, which is the unboxing. And once you have this boxing and unboxing operation, you could imagine that your programming language just contains some predefined library functions for certain tasks. For example, reverting a circuit would have this type, and simplifying a circuit maybe, you know, like for example, removing redundant gates, you can calculate the size of a circuit or even convert a circuit to a PDF document, right? Like if you wanted to print it like I did on a slide, right? All these could be sort of basically provided by either the implementation or some library, right? And you could use that to, to um, turn them into higher order things. All right. Now, because Quipper is a circuit generation language, 
you know, for, for these reasons that I described. It shares some of the features and complications with other things like hardware description languages, okay? Because in a circuit description language or a hardware description language, you essentially have two run times, right? You compile your program and you run your program and then the program outputs a circuit and then you run that circuit possibly at a different time and place on a different device, right? So circuit generation time is when the circuits get generated. That's basically what my functional programming language does. And then circuit execution time is when someone runs the circuit, typically on a piece of hardware, or you could just send it to IBM and they'll run it, you know, like on their quantum computer, or you could run it in a simulator or whatever. So we have these two different run times. And now any sort of piece of data that's known at circuit generation time is called parameters. And any sort of data that's only known at circuit execution time is called state, okay? So um, one way of thinking of what a parameter is, is my functional programs typically do not describe a single circuit. They typically describe a family of circuit family of circuits, right? You want to factor integers, you want to write a program that inputs an integer, then outputs the quantum circuit that's going to factor that integer, right? And then for a different integer, you get a different circuit, at least certainly for every size of integer, you would get a different circuit, but sometimes you'd have even get a different circuit for each integer that you want to factor, right? So that parameter here is the integer I want to factor, and then the, it, you know, and that's, that's going to affect which circuit gets generated, and then the state is the actual quantum states that happen when I run the circuit, right? Which are big, uh, these kind of things that Jennifer described, the superpositions of stuff, right? And it turns out that this <coughs> distinction between parameters and states is quite important, right? Because if you try to use a state at circuit generation time, it just doesn't work. That's why you can't say if this qubit is zero, then do one thing, else do another thing, because the qubit's not going to really be known at circuit generation time at all. So um, uh, you can't have that operation. You can't take a state and turn it into a parameter, basically. So you can do it uh, in the QRAM world, because you can just, you're online, so you can say, please measure qubit number five, right? But if you're generating a circuit for batch operation, then you cannot do this sort of thing where you have a measurement influence what happens next. And that's because the measurement gives you a state and not a parameter. So there's various ways of uh, integrating um, states and parameters into um, sort of programming languages. So there's Quire, which is the stuff that Robert Rand and Jennifer and Steve Zdanjevich uh, um, developed, which is a programming language embedded in, in Coq, and it works really nicely. And in, their, in this Quire language, parameters and state are completely separate. So they're, they're different syntactic entities. They have their own namespace. Um, they even live on different levels. Like one of them, parameters live in the host language and state basically lives in the embedded language, right? And in, in the Quipper-like languages, we like parameters and state to share the same states, the same namespace, to be treated as one and the same. So you can have data types that are part parameter and part state, like a pair of a qubit and a boolean, or a list of qubits where the length of the list would be a kind of parameter, because you know how many qubits you have, but the actual qubits in the list would be state, right? So that's what makes it Quipper-like. Parameters and states are sort of all treated as one thing, and then you can have quantum data types. Now the problem with boxing is, um, boxing really only works for simple types. So a type is simple if it's basically a tuple of qubits. So, you know, what kind of thing could a circuit have as an input or an output? You, a particular circuit can have maybe three qubits as the inputs and four qubits as the outputs, right? But, but functional programs typically describe family of, families of, of circuits, right? So you couldn't, if you have, you know, like for example, the quantum Fourier transform is a function that inputs a list of qubits and outputs a list of qubits. And if you give it seven, if you give it a list of seven qubits, it will apply some gates to the seven qubits and then return seven qubits, right? But if you try to box that, you, well, there's a whole family of circuits being described, and when you want to box it, you need to say which member of the family, right? And this gives a lot of problems in the actual Quipper. This is where a lot of the unsoundness in Quipper comes from. Here's an example of an actual simple Quipper program. So I define some random circuit called MyCirc, and it inputs a list of qubits, 
and it outputs a pair of a list of qubits and one more qubit. So this, this my circ is just some, uh, like I said, some, uh, some random circuit that I wrote. And it, so the circuit, uh, the circuit looks like this. So it inputs a list of qubits and then outputs one more qubit than, than the input was, right? And that's a functional, that's, a, that's sort of a, a program here in, in Quipper. So, and you can already see when I want to actually print the circuit, which I just did, because I just called the main one function, I have to call the previewer, okay, with the circuit. And then I also have to specify this dummy piece of data, which is very annoying. I have to make a list of three things, and it doesn't matter what the three thing things are, so I actually make them undefined, which in Haskell is just a diverging thing, right? So, right, I have to say, I can't just say print the, print the circuit from my circ, right? I have to say print which member of this family of circuits. So, for example, print the circuit for, th for a list of three input qubits, right? And it's, it's annoying in Quipper that you have to pass around these things that we call shape arguments just to tell it how long the list is without telling it what the actual qubits are. And then when you, when you want to reverse the circuit, the same thing happens. You, have to, you can't just say reverse this function because you can't in general invert a function, right? But you have to say reverse this function when specialized at this particular input. That means what's internally going to do is it's going to box the circuit for input size three, then reverse the box circuit and turn that back into a function. So the new function is going to have the correct type, but the new function would only really work for lists of three qubits. If you try to take that new function and apply it to a list of two qubits, you just get a runtime error because that's not the <laughs> member of the family that you had reversed, okay? So, and that's basically super annoying because the, you can t check nothing at compile time and it's all just the programmer's responsibility. So here's the reversed, uh, why do I keep doing control P? Here's the reversed circuit, okay? There's nothing very special about that except you might be worried about reversing something that's not actually invertible, but that's okay, because reverse means the adjoint, not the inverse. But, um, but there's these extra things that we call shape arguments that we have to constantly carry around. And if I, if I made this second list, for example, a list of two, you know, a list of length two instead of a list of length three, then, uh, then this would probably just crash with some really horrible error message, you know, shape of arguments does not match length of the list or something like that. So that's, that's part of the unsoundness of the actual Quipper. Uh, okay, where did my slides go? Here, yes. All right, so boxing really only makes sense at simple types. Uh, and it doesn't make sense to have a, a list of qubits to, to, to be the thing that you wanna you know, if that's the input to a function, then you have to have further information before you can box it. But every quantum data type is isomorphic to a possibly infinite sum of simple types. That's why it's called simple, because everything else is a sum of that. Okay, that's also called that in vector spaces, for example. Um, so, for example, a list of qubits is either a list of zero qubits or a list of one qubit or a list of two qubits or a list of three qubits and so on. So it can be written as a sum of simple types. Now, dependent types are exactly what we need to untie this little Gordian knot. And it was probably obvious to everyone even like 15 minutes ago, and it's certainly obvious to everyone even 10 years ago, right? Dependent types are a much better way of dealing with parameters and state because you can say, instead of saying it's a function from list of qubits to list of qubits where you don't know how many qubits it's gonna return for every given input list, you can just say uh, for all n, take a vector of n qubits and output a vector of n qubits. And when you want to reverse that, for example, you only reverse this part, not this part, right? You're not gonna output an n, you're still gonna input an n, but then you're gonna reverse the function that goes from here to here. So if that were n and n plus one, then the inverse would be n plus one and n, but you wouldn't change this part of the, of the function at all. So here's your parameter and here's your state, and we've separated the two. So you would say, why are you separating them now when you just made a big deal about wanting to smish them together, right? Uh, the point is we can still have natural data types like lists of qubits. We just have to be, have be sufficiently dependently typed that we can convert between, between these two and then, then it can be sort of type safe and convenient at the same time, right? Which is sort of what we want. Now, so it was clear to us probably even 
five or eight years ago that we would really like uh, dependent types, but the problem is no one really has a good way of doing linear dependent type systems, right? We love dependent types. You can program in Agda or maybe in Coq or you know, Idris or whatever. Linear stuff is nice too, but so in the literature you find basically two approaches to linear dependent type theories, and it all comes down to what is the interpretation of this? You have some, some thing A in the environment, and then you have a term M of A where the type of that is also a function of A, right? That is the quintessential thing that a dependent type can do for you, that the term, the type also depends on some, you know, on some value. And then the question is, what if A is a linear resource? Like, what do you do, right? Because what's to the left and right of this colon are very different. The stuff to the right of the colon will be evaluated at type checking time. The stuff to the left of the colon will hopefully be evaluated at runtime when the program runs, right? But if, if A was a linear resource, what does that even mean? That you've, you, you've mentioned it here in a term and you've mentioned it in a type, so in some sense you've duplicated it and used it twice, right? And depending how you want to handle that situation, you get a different philosophy about a dependent type theory. So one, op one, one uh, possibility is just to separate parameters and states completely, to have to split your context into a linear part and a nonlinear part, and say they're two different namespaces, two different function spaces, two different lambdas, two different applications. That's basically the system of Sarasato and Fenning. And then you say the only things that can be used as indices are these, you know, are the nonlinear things. That, so that's sort of killing off all the interesting stuff in a, in a way. And then there's this approach by McBride, who says even if A is a linear resource. I'm actually still allowed to mention it in B of A, but, it's not con but he makes a distinction between mentioning A and actually consuming A in the sense of actually using up the linear resource. So he says, we only mentioned it here, but we didn't really consume it, so that doesn't count as a violation of linearity. Unfortunately, McBride's idea, even though it's very clever, doesn't work for quantum computing, because in a quantum world, you cannot even hypothetically duplicate a quantum thing. Even God doesn't know what the outcome of the measurement would have been if you hadn't done it, right? And you get paradoxes if you actually try to do this. So we decided, and this took us years to figure out, and now we finally figured it out. The third way, which we think is just the correct way of doing this, which is we allow this kind of judgment, even when A is a linear resource, but we interpret it differently. We say B may only depend on the parameter part of the linear resource. So if A is a list of qubits, then B of A can only depend on the, it's going to be a family of types, but it only depends on the length of the list. It doesn't depend on the actual qubits. So that we're actually talking about, so we call the parameter part of a resource the shape of that resource. So the shape of a list would just be the length, for example. <coughs> All right. So you can calculate, so formally what we do is we calculate the shape of any, we calculate the shape of types and terms. So shape is kind of the forgetful operation that throws away all the, the state and keeps just the parameters. So the shape of a qubit is just a unit, for example. The shape of a list of qubits is just a list of units, which is the same thing as an integer, i.e. the length, I mean a natural number, right? And the shape of other types are basically defined recursively. And then all the magic happens in this kinding rule for, for the dependent type. So we say, if the dependent type depends on x, and the variable x is declared to be of type A, then for the purpose of kind checking, that variable x will actually have type shape of A. So the, the A in this will actually have a different type than the A in that, okay? Which is non-standard and a bit difficult to accept. You really have to check all the proofs later of soundness and so on to, to make sure that you didn't screw anything up really badly because usually it's a bad idea to just <laughs> have a variable, use it with different types in different contexts, right? And then you get the other typing rules basically follow, uh, follow from, this, from this concept. And it has a denotational semantics, and it has a categorical semantics, which we just submitted to Lix, so it's called a state parameter vibration, and it uses Grothendieck vibrations, and it's extremely technical and complicated, but cool, okay? But I'm not gonna talk about that. Our language has an operational semantics. We prove soundness and type safety. So actually, whatever goes well at compilation time, will not, you will not have runtime errors in this language. And we have an implementation which Frank here wrote, which is super cool. It's, it's unbelievable, like 
what this man can do. I could have never done the implementation like that. He basically made a linear agda, so it has, and, and it also. Hi, uh, Leon from uh, Duke University. Hi. Um, I have a question about um, uh, classical feedback, because if I understand uh, your language describes uh, circuits, but Correct. I didn't see anything about classical feedback. Can you explain that? Right. So in, in ProtoQuipper, we don't have classical feedback at the moment. In Quipper, we have it, but it's not completely type safe. So in, in Quipper, you could actually, so yes, we describe circuits, right? But in the end, circuits are just going to be lists of gates and lists in, so I'm talking about the actual Quipper now that's an embedded language in Haskell, right? In Haskell, lists are lazy. So what you do with a list depends sort of, you know, so example, one thing you could do with a list of gates is just actually send it to the quantum computer in real time. And because lists are lazy, you can do that at the same time that the list is being generated. And then in the middle of that list, you can ask to do a measurement and it would trigger what we call the dynamic lifting. So you're sending this batch circuit to the quantum computer. At some point, you stop sending gates and you say, now the quantum computer actually has to run the circuit, give me a measurement and I pass that back to the classical program. So we can have this in Quipper, but it's a very expensive operation, right? Because we imagine I can generate 30 million gates and the quantum computer will execute them really fast. But then if I have to wait for the outcome of the next measurement and wait for my classical program to make a decision about what to do next, from the viewpoint of the quantum world, this is taking eons, right? Like classical computers take very long and it needs the next gate in 100, nanoseconds or something, then, then the problem is that you have to kind of, the, the quantum computer has to just sort of sit there while it's waiting for the classical computer to work. And then the problem with quantum data is that it decays very, very quickly. So you have to basically apply huge amounts of error correction just to keep that state for, let's say, half a second. And so that's a very expensive operation. Um, so how are you planning to solve it then? So you, you have to have a run function for the circ operation, right? And one of the run functions could be run it on the quantum computer. And then only in the context of that run function could you have <laughs> dynamic lifting. Obviously, you can't measure something if you're just memorizing the circuit so you can later reverse it, right? That, that, that doesn't even make so sense. So like for now, if I understand it correctly, you just see everything before the measurement uh, as a separate circuit from everything after the measurement. Yeah, you can structure it that way. And it's actually a good way to do it in practice. Because you might generate 30 million gates, and then you want to measure a million of them. So if you could tell the quantum computer to please hold, measure these million gates, and then wait you know, while I make up my mind, it's better than doing it one gate at a time. So yes. But I mean, so we could send the circuit in batches, right? Like the before part and the after <laughs> part. But in principle, each batch could also just be a single gate. That's so true. then you're back to the QRAM model. So basically, we want to be able to do everything the QRAM model does, but we also want to be able to generate circuits quite efficiently in large quantities. OK, thank you. Yep. Hi, Alex Aniket, also from Duke. Um, you touched upon this a little bit about you know, optimiza optimization of circuits. I just wanted to understand how extensive is the support in, uh, in ProtoCuper about you know, optimizing a given circuit uh -huh. or like, you know, reducing the number of redundant gates in it? So in ProtoQuipper it's zero because we're not optimizing any circuits. In Quipper we have libraries for that. So there's, and you can write your own libraries because of, you know, the way Quipper is designed, right? So we, we've written some libraries just to illustrate how you would write a circuit optimizer, but they're relatively, I would say, um, naive. So if you have two consecutive C0 gates, then, you know, it's just the identity. And we have some heuristics, basically kind of peephole optimization where you look at nearby gates and you look it up and see if there's a simpler way to do that very thing. But doing global optimization on circuits is clearly, an, I mean, to get the optimal circuit that does a given operation is an NP-complete problem even in classical circuits. So we're not going to be able to do that. But so the answer is we haven't put our energies into writing the world's best optimizer, but rather just given the programmer the tools that they can write their own optimizers and experiment with them. Uh, so I think we'll take the rest of the questions offline. Um, thanks so much for to Peter. Um, you should find Peter and Frank, who's in the uh, corner over there uh, during the breaks, and ask them to show you proto in practice. And uh, yeah, come back at 10.30. Cool. Thank you.